morning everyone. Uh, so yesterday we started taking a look at uh, some basic uh, chemical reactions. Uh, this section can be sort of summarized here. Uh, we're going to be doing a predict, classify, and a balance. So it turns out for these uh, six simple types of reactions, we've done three yesterday, we're going to finish off with three today. Uh, for these uh, simple reactions, we're just making a guess. We could totally be wrong. But based on what are the ingredients and the reactants going into it, we can see if we can make a prediction with uh, what chemicals do we expect out of it until we actually do that experiment and actually analyze what we get. I'm not actually sure what we actually got. Uh, in terms of classifying, we're going to, in total, have six types of reactions. So far, we've seen three types. Uh, we're going to start off here with the synthesis reaction. This is in no particular order, just the order that we did it in. A synthesis reaction, I'm going to put bracket S for that. Synthesis involves taking chemical A and B, and as I synthesize, just like if you synthesize an essay together, you put it together, things combine. Uh, we still need to double check when I uh, produce that compound, that I've written the compound correctly. Uh, that's usually a source of um, some problems with balancing later on. Uh, sometimes you need to make sure you've uh, named the compounds right, the ratio's correct, uh, before you go on. Sort of the opposite of synthesis here is a decomposition reaction. Uh, decomposition here is when things decompose and fall apart. Really easy to recognize because we just have one chemical and then an arrow. If we assume a complete decomposition, we're going to basically have just A and B as separated. Careful, especially if there's those diatomics, those hot wrinkle ones. Whenever those are by themselves, they have to appear as two. We're going to uh, finish off uh, our recap here uh, just with combustion reactions. We can use C for that. Combustion, what's nice is you're going to take whatever the thing you're burning, it's always involving a reaction with oxygen. Oxygen is a diatomic, so this, we have to put an O2 there. And then we always um, fully assume complete combustion. We get the fully CO2 and we get the full uh, water product afterwards. If it was partial combustion, we would otherwise get carbon and carbon monoxide. Uh, it is possible to balance uh, using those partial methods as well, but uh, for simplicity, we're just going to straight do everything uh, as uh, complete combustion. Um, we talked about uh, having to balance here because we need to have mass being conserved. Basically, all the atoms need to be accounted for. The only thing that's really changing for a chemical change uh, when we produce a new substance is that we're actually playing around with electrons, breaking up some bonds, reattaching them, and somehow with different proportions, they're actually totally different chemicals. Uh, I should realize afterwards I didn't quite get back to this activity table. We're going to use this in uh, today's lesson on single replacement reactions. We're going to have a look at double replacement reactions, and then we're going to look at a special case of double replacement as neutralization. So uh, we're going to start off uh, pretty much the same as yesterday, but taking a look at three other types of reactions, same three keywords, see if based on the reactants you can make a prediction, a guess of what we make, uh, classification as one of the three new types, and then balancing to make sure all the atoms are accounted for. So. Uh, for reaction type number four, we are going to use this guy here. It's called an activity series. This activity series is sort of a simplified picture from a much larger redox table. Some textbooks don't even frame it in this fashion, but uh, I find this way here is fairly uh, useful to uh, work with. So we're going to do a single replacement. Let's look at this activity chart. Uh, we're going to be doing double replacement, which looks at what's called a solubility chart, and then go from there. So uh, if you can just keep going in your notebooks here, uh, let's look at uh, type number four which is a single replacement reaction. For a single replacement reaction, I'm going to shorthand that SR. As the name suggests, it is one thing, a single, that actually replaces one that's bonded. So in this case here, let's do a generic formula here. Let's think I have chemical A, it's reacting with BC. That's what I'm going to be looking for as structured on the reactant side. Uh, usually A is going to be an element of some sort, but even for this element here, it could be metal or non-metal. In this case here, we're used for argument's sake here. Let's say A happens to be a metal. If A is a metal, this metal can swap out potentially the metal that's currently in compound. So then A is going to be bonded with C. Poor old B that got kicked off is now ending up being replaced. So one person came in. It's always going to be a metal fighting a metal, or it could be a non-metal fighting a non-metal. Let's say I have uh, DE, just to again remind you, order doesn't matter. So I have one guy coming along by themselves. Let's say F, in this case here, as the elemental compound, is actually a non-metal. Potentially, this non-metal can trade spaces with the other non-metal. Remember, non-metals actually come afterwards. So in this case here, I would get DF, and then poor old E got kicked off. So in both cases, we had a single replacement, also called the single displacement. 
In this case here, you're going to actually um, need to check our activity series because not every time an element comes along, the compound is going to break up. We have to look at factors like how strongly held together the compound is, how likely is this chemical able to sort of replace and sort of uh, compete and kick off this B here. We need to check this activity series. Um, so. Uh, with this activity series here, uh, you could be given this uh, as sort of your regular grade 11, grade 12 table. Um, we will need to memorize it on the uh, non-metal side, not too hard. We're going to do that in Chapter 3. Um, otherwise, you just um, just sort of predict. Uh, if you actually watched the reaction happen, if you saw bubbles uh, forming, if you saw a color change and some sense that a chemical change has occurred, you know that uh, this has happened. So uh, for this activity series here, it's a very tiny table. Notice that it separates the columns from metal because it's going to be metal fighting against metal, non-metal fighting against non-metal. In this case here, what we're going to have is an arrow going down decreasing activity. If I am higher up on this chart, say I was potassium, and say I was trying to fight someone lower on the chart here, because I'm higher up on the chart, I am a more active element than iron. So if I currently was by myself, I can kick off iron that is com uh, currently in a compound. So the summary from this table here is the more active, so higher elements, anything that's higher up on this list, higher elements can replace, or you can say even displace, displace means kicks off, displace any lower elements in compound. So that's essentially how you basically read it there. Um, uh, we can do a sort of analogy here for a single replacement. Uh, maybe you have one person, a uh, guy. Uh, we have a guy-girl couple. Uh, on comes this guy here. Maybe he's somehow more attractive. Maybe he's uh, richer, what have you, whatever's on your list. And maybe the girl's going to be like, oh, I'm going to ditch the first guy and let's go for the other guy. So a single replacement, that only happens if uh, C finds A to be uh, a better, uh, better suited partner. Uh, similarly here it could be the girl as well. We can have a couple, uh, on comes another girl. Um, if they are a more active girl and they're higher up on this activity series, they can have no trouble kicking off anyone lower than it. These reactions here are 100% in the forward reaction, which means that once that swap has occurred, uh, when B got uh, kicked off, B actually has no chance of actually swapping A back out because A as the more active metal actually is already forming the stronger bond with C. It's the better match, it's the better partner, and therefore it's actually 0% the opposite way. So for a single place in reaction, uh, make a note to yourself here, we do need to check this activity series. We need to check uh, who's going to end up forming the stronger compound. And basically I wrote down earlier, uh, anything that's higher up can kick off anyone that's lower than it. So for example, uh, let's take a look at, I have aluminum, it's going to react with copper 2 chloride. Again, they're only going to give you the left hand side. Here's the things I mix together. Is this in such a way that it's going to replace or not replace? In this case here, we see it to be a single replacement. We have one person by themselves elemental, the other one is in compound. The element currently here is actually a metal, so what we're going to do is the metal will potentially swap out the metal uh, in the compound. So right now it's the competition between aluminum fighting against copper. Let's take a look at activity series and let's figure out where's aluminum, where's copper. Uh, aluminum is right here and copper is a fair bit lower than it. Aluminum is the more active metal, it's the more attractive one, it's the richer one. So aluminum has no trouble kicking off C. We are going to end up getting a compound with aluminum bonded with chlorine, although I still need to check the charges to make sure I write the correct compound, and poor old copper gets kicked off. Uh, what is the correct compound for aluminum chloride? As I mentioned, in general, it's not going to be these numbers carried over. It's not, oh, Cl2, this has to be Cl2. Definitely not Cl is diatomic because Cl is not by itself. In this case, here we check the charges. Aluminum is plus 3. Chlorine is a halogen, negative 1, which means my correct subscript is AlCl3. Once you work out that ratio, don't show the charges anymore. But wait, the numbers don't match up. Remember, that's fine. Balancing comes as a really last step. We can then add coefficients and then basically rescale the equation, rescale the proportions so all the atoms are accounted for. Uh, for this, especially, I would probably leave the balancing of the elements till the end because as I change the number here, it doesn't actually change any other element. If I put a number by the compound, it might fix one element, but it might screw up another element. In this case here, chlorine at the very least is 2, the other chlorine is 3, both 2 and 3 go into 6, so let's triple this and let's double this. In that case there, I now have 3 coppers, let's put a 3 in front of copper, 2 aluminum, so let's put a 2 in front of aluminum there. So that is a single replacement reaction, this is because A was more active, A ended up forming the stronger bond um, 
um, than the CU. In contrast, if I had started from the other side, if I started with a solution, let's uh, dissolve in some aluminum chloride, let's drop chunks and chunks of copper, again, it's set up to look like a single replacement. It's set up, uh, copper here is a metal, copper can potentially kick off aluminum. You check the chart, copper, oh, it's actually lower than aluminum. Copper is not able to actually swap off aluminum. In that case here, we can say NR, let me write this down for you here. When copper is fighting against aluminum chloride, sort of the opposite reaction, I just swap reactants and products. You can either cross the arrow and say no reaction. You can write out the word no reaction, or you can just say NR for short. So nothing changes. So 100% one direction, but it is 0% going the opposite way because the more active metal has already um, coupled up. So checking the chart there, uh, I want you to uh, see for this reaction, uh, let's react uh, Br2 and let's react it with KBr. First thing to do is recognize that it's single replacement. We have one thing that's elemental, even though it is happening to be diatomic. We have one thing that's in compound, I'll just put CPD for short there. The elemental currently is a non-metal, so potentially, oh sorry, uh, let's make the question here, uh, KF. Um, potentially the non-metal can actually swap places with the non-metal. It's always metal, swap metal, non-metal, swap non-metal. Sometimes I end up with people ending up with having both non-metals together or both metals together, that's wrong. So let's check bromine and let's check fluorine, let's check who's more active. In this case here we have bromine and fluorine. This is actually exactly the way that the periodic table is laid out. Fluorine is actually a tiny radius. It actually gains electrons and hogs electrons best. In this case here, bromine unfortunately is lower than fluorine. Bromine is less active. So in this case here, bromine is less active. So just like the one I just demonstrated here, this one here would be no reaction. It just doesn't happen, RxN for short. Right, so that there is a single placement. You have to check the activity series. Let's swap over now and double it into a double replacement reaction or double displacement reaction. So double replacement reaction, we're gonna put DR. Uh, let's just do the sort of generic format that we're gonna be looking at here. We're gonna be checking for sort of compound react with compound. So let's say I have AB reacting with CD. Because this is a replacement reaction, I would imagine I need to check the activity series. Let's say for argument's sake here, A is actually more active than C. Right, metal fighting against metal. If A is higher up on the chart, is A going to be a kickoff C? Well, of course. We're going to end up getting AD. Previously, C would have been by itself, but you notice that A actually needs to break the bond with B. Upon creating the new compound, the C ends up joining with B. So it's basically doing like a mix and match here, a swapping of partners. I want to show you sort of the other uh, alternative here. It's possible it could have been, again, A, B, and C, D, the only other alternative is maybe C was actually more active, right? Either one's higher or the other's higher. If C is more active, is C going to be to kick off A? Well, again, if it's more active, it forms a stronger bond. In this case here, we're going to end up getting CB. A, who gets kicked off, ends up bonding together with AD. What are we noticing on the product side here? Hopefully you're able to see again, the left-right order doesn't matter. We're producing AD and CB no matter which way. Because we're getting the same products either way, we don't need to check activity series, right? Because I'm gonna get the same products for whoever, like we're, we're gonna know the swap happened. However, what we're gonna do is we're gonna check for a lot of these compounds here, because it's sort of a compound reacting with a compound, it's really hard to make solid and solid. Not impossible, but the kinetic energy is just very, very low. What we're gonna usually do is we're gonna take this compound, pre-dissolve it in water, take this compound, pre-dissolve it in water, now that we're talking about compounds in water, we need to check something called the solubility chart. A solubility chart will give me, am I soluble? Do I dissolve well? Am I low soluble? Do I dissolve very poorly? So in this case here, I didn't need to check activity series. I get the same products. But for a double replacement, I want you to check the solubility chart. And again, I'll give you the reasons for that. Uh, check if she's, how come we don't need to? We get the same products, whoever is more active. But we need to check solubility chart. The reason for this is usually these solutions take place in aqueous. So usually because there's water around, I want to know, am I going to dissolve, am I going to break up, or am I going to stick together? So uh, let's just try out a compound here. They're only going to give you the reactant side. Let's say CaCO2 and Na2CO3. They're just going to give you that left-hand side. Again, the three keywords, predict, balance, classify. Based on this reaction type, can you make a guess at what we're going to form? What we're going to see 
uh, similar to a synthesis, sort of one thing plus another thing, but this time it's not just element and element. This time it's actually a compound, metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non we actually have compound and compound. They both are paired up. What's going to happen here is they can potentially swap partners. They can end up trading partners. In this case here, when they trade partners, we're going to end up having calcium bonded with the carbonate partner. I would still need to double check here that I've written that formula correctly. Sodium here got uh, uh, left behind. The sodium ends up reacting with Cl. As I mentioned, in general, these numbers don't drag over. Don't be like, oh, Cl2, so this has to be Cl2. I can check the compound for myself. The reason why this Co3 dragged over was because that was a polyatomic. The polyatomic itself uh, holds together. In fact, especially as we get to balancing here, you can actually balance the whole, uh, whole polyatomic altogether, and we'll see that in a second here. So let's first double check, even before I think about balancing, I swap my partners. Calcium is now with carbonate, sodium is now with chlorine. I check that I have a metal and non-metal in both compounds. What's the correct ratios for sodium and chlorine? Well, sodium is alkali metal plus one, chlorine is negative one, so that's good, one to one. Calcium is alkaline earth metal plus two, carbonate is negative two, that's also good. And then now as the last step here, we do the balancing. Well, we have one calcium, one calcium. I'm gonna balance the carbonate as a grouping here. I have one CO3 grouping, I have one CO3 grouping, that's all good. If I put a two in front, I would double the entire CO3 grouping, so I can treat the polyatomic altogether. And it's just the sodium and the chlorines I need to worry about. I actually have two sodiums and two chlorines, and they have one and one, so I need to put a two in front. That would double both the sodium and uh, both the chlorine. If I ask you what are the sum of all the coefficients, make sure you add up all these other ones here. All right. In this case there, we've done it. It's a formula equation. You can predict it. It's a double placement reaction. Um, in this case here, writing it, this is actually called a formula equation because I've used the chemical formulas for all of these ones here. But because, like I mentioned, if these ones here are ionic compounds, these are solids, it's really hard to mix just solid and solid together. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pre-dissolve the calcium chloride. I'm going to take powdered CaCl2, drop it in water. We'll do this in a section later on, and we're going to see, is the CaCl2, is it going to dissolve or not dissolve? So here's where you can check your solubility chart. Solubility chart is going to be in the on the back of your activity series. This uh, is your solubility chart here. A couple key things. We're going to use the term here soluble. Soluble means you dissolve. And if you dissolve, the state of matter I should give you is AQ. AQ means dissolved in water. If it says low soluble later on, it means you don't dissolve very well. So very uh, poorly dissolves. And because it very poorly dissolves, we're going to say it's solid. So roughly what this chart gives you is a way to actually check compound by compound, are things soluble? Now, everything dissolves to a certain extent. We usually set a reference here. We're going to come back to this number later on. If I manage to dissolve more than 0 0.1 moles per liter, we're going to call you soluble. Anything less than that, 0 0.099, we're going to call you low soluble. So we put a sort of benchmark, and we also set a temperature, because solubility usually changes. Usually when you heat things up, things become more soluble. If everything is at 25 degrees, and you wanted to compare sort of chemical by chemical, this combination, we want to figure out who's soluble and who's not soluble. Uh, the way this chart here is outlined here is we have, we go from the most soluble attachments, pairs on top. As you work our way downwards, we're getting less and less soluble. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So less soluble going down that way. What we're going to do is we're going to separate out the columns. We're going to start off looking at the negative ion first. Looking at the compound, you start off with the negative, and then you mix and match it with the positive. Earlier, I had the compound here, calcium chloride. I want to know when I pre-dissolve this reactant, I want to know whether it dissolves or doesn't dissolve. So start off with the negative. The negative is chlorine. Um, chlorine here shows it right here. So now it sort of focuses my attention just on this middle part. Now what I do is I mix and match it with the positive. This is chlorine who's bonded with calcium. Calcium will either in this top category or calcium will be in this bottom category. What it says here is when silver bonds with chloride or lead 2 or copper 1, those ones there are low soluble. Those ones there are a bit solid. Well, that's none of calcium. Calcium would actually be here. You just mix and match it and you look across. When chlorine bonds with calcium, that's a soluble. If it's a soluble, it says right away AQ. So that's how you check this chart here. You can test it compound by compound. And in this case here, it's going to be AQ. Let's test the other compound while I have it on the chart here. The other compound was Na2CO3. Start with the negative. Carbonate is way down here. We'd expect it to be not very soluble. In fact, carbonate with a lot of chemicals is low soluble. But where might sodium appear? Now, sodium here is group number one. 
group number one is called the alkali metals. They remind you, uh, if you've forgotten here, your alkali metals are lithium, diamond, and francium. They all have a plus one charge. Sodium would actually be covered in the alkali ions. So therefore, sodium carbonate, that combination will actually be soluble. So I can actually put an AQ for sodium carbonate. In fact, this is a nice memory aid for you. Again, unfortunately, in the IB data booklet, we're not given the solubility chart, but there are some common things that you want to know. In this case here, if I have any alkali ions, H+, or ammonium, you notice when these ones here are bonded with any nonmetal, these ones here are all fully soluble. So that's one uh, good thing to just keep in mind. Keep in mind, alkali salts are always soluble. So if I happen to have a uh, reaction that, oh, I need sodium ions in solution, oh, you're never going to get a bottle of just pure Na+. It's unstable because it's charged. But you can reach for sodium anything because you can give, be guaranteed any sodium compound, sodium chloride, in this case sodium carbonate, anything is overly soluble as well. Other things that also behave like this, there is an anion that under the, these uh, restrictions here, the nitrate with any positive, silver nitrate, copper nitrate, chromium nitrate, palladium nitrate, all of those are also soluble, so I'd also include that here. Alkali salts are always soluble along with, so H plus and NH4 plus, those ones are plus one just like an alkali is, and the other one here is nitrates are always soluble as well. So I'm going to also say if I have a nitrate salt, it also is going to be something that's very soluble as well. So go through and just check the other two for me here. So I have, we just checked CaCl2, this one was soluble, that means fully broken up. We'll come back to this in a later lesson. When it gets fully broken up, it means I just have plain old calcium ions, plain old copper ions, they're no longer holding hands, they're just actually swimming around by themselves. Sure, the ratio actually says there's two chlorines like that. You might be worried, wait a second, if chlorine is by itself, shouldn't it be diatomic? In this case here, it is by itself in the sense it's just one single atom, but it's actually being stabilized by water around it. Water, we're going to see in a later lesson, is a polar molecule. Water has a positive side and a negative side. What water can do is actually is come around these charges here. So for example here, this Cl minus here, which otherwise would have been unstable, water, looks like this one here, water overall is neutral. We're going to come back and we're going to see, well, these bonds here are actually not evenly shared. Oxygen is actually more of a bully. Oxygen actually hogs a little bit of the charge towards itself. Electrons lie closer to the oxygen side. That would leave a slightly positive end on the other side. If I have a chlorine, this one here is unstable. If water comes around it and actually points its hydrogens, it can actually help to stabilize it. Now, it can't actually get rid of the negative because water, like we said, is overall neutral, but at least water will actually complex it, will help spread all that charge. So yes, in some sense, chlorine is by itself, but it's not because it's actually being stabilized. Chemicals that act like water in this are going to be called ligands later on, and they stabilize the negative. Exactly the opposite happens to calcium. For the calcium, charges should be unstable, especially such high charges like plus two, but water can come along. Water can point its hydrogen ends around this calcium here, we know the oxygen end is uh, more negative, and it can actually help to stabilize the calcium. Can't get rid of calcium's charge, but again, it can help spread out that charge. That's what we mean by CaCl2, it's aqueous. NH2CO3 we just saw was aqueous as well. So this guy here also gets broken apart. Careful when we're dealing with a polyatomic, water is good enough to actually separate positive and negative, break the ionic bonds, it's able to stabilize the charges, but it is not strong enough to actually break apart the covalent compound. So when this one here dissociates, again, we'll get back into this uh, later on, Na plus is by itself, the carbonate grouping, CO3 stays intact, but overall is a negative, and this one here gets uh, surrounded by waters, just like we saw for the calcium chloride. Uh, let's check the solubility chart for the other two here. We have calcium carbonate and we have sodium chloride here. Calcium carbonate, you're actually going to find it's going to be low solid, uh, low soluble, so solid, and whereas NaCl here is going to be aqueous. Now one thing I want to keep in mind here, it's not impossible for you to get NaCl solid. Right, table salt commonly comes to us as solid. When we actually put down these states here, AQ or even this S here, what we're saying is having dropped them in water, having potentially dissolved them, we want to see whether they dissolve or not. In this case here, <clears throat> what we're starting to write is something called a complete ionic equation, or sometimes even called a total ionic equation. So a total ionic equation. Uh, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to dissociate, we're going to break up any ones that we label as aqueous, but what we're going to do is we're going to leave any 
In this case here, we will only get solids. Uh, later on in this course here, we're going to actually see liquids actually forming. We would also leave liquids alone, but in this case here, again, only solids. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go from my formula equation that had all the chemical formulas, all the positive negatives, metal first, and all that written out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break them all up. This will become easier when we actually learn the dissociation. But sort of what I drew for you, water has come and separated the positive from negative. So in this first case, although the bottle may be labeled CaCO2 aqueous, we actually mean Ca plus 2 ions, 2 Cl minus ions, Na2CO3 is likewise aqueous, 2 Na plus ions, CO3, that's the polyatomic, that stays intact, that's a minus 2. These are all aqueous. If this were a big test, I would definitely write down all these aqueous. They're all dis dissolved, they're all stabilized by water. The only one that I would leave by itself is the calcium carbonate. This one here sticks as a solid. And because that one there is a solid, um, just skip over that for now, uh, we have 2 Na+, plus. this is aqueous, and we have 2 Cl-, minus, also aqueous. A little bit tedious, right? That's called the complete ionic equation. We will only have a complete ionic equation, total ionic equation, when we're dealing with double replacement style reactions. So you don't need to now go back and say, what's the net ionic for combustion or anything, something like that. It's only important really here. And now what we're going to observe for a properly worded question, you're going to find that the reactants were supposedly going to be um, aqueous because the whole notion was a solid and a solid is really hard to react together. What we have is a container full of CaCl2. That part there dissolves no problem. We have a container full of Na plus and Cl3. That part there dissolves no problem. You're going to throw them together into just one big container. When you have the big container, you have calcium ions to chloride ions. That's two there is just by ratio. So you now have all four ions happening to swim together. Calcium was perfectly fine being dissolved with chloride. You check that. But now that's being tossed into the beaker, which also has carbonate. I also want to check, is calcium OK having carbonate around? And what we said is, nope, calcium carbonate doesn't happen to be very soluble. So you may have had calcium from one side, carbonate from the other side. When these guys collide together, they say, wait, we're not supposed to dissolve very well. When they collide together, they're actually going to crash out a solution. We're going to end up uh, qualitatively. We're going to get a uh, powder on the bottom here, and we're going to get solid CaCO3 form. In this case here, that is a solid that comes out of solution. We're going to use the terminology a precipitate. A precipitate is something that's low soluble and it comes out of solution. We're going to say PPT for short. So a properly worded question here, you should find the reactants are always aqueous. Again, the whole point was to have them mixed up so they're easy to mix and match here. On the other side, there's no bets though. On the other side, in this case, it could be one solid. It could be both solid. It could be both aqueous. Basically, what we're trying to do here is Double replacements always make it look like, because we switched partners, did we really create two new things? Did we really form bonds? What we're actually seeing in this one here, although I'm writing the bottle as NaCl aqueous, because this is aqueous, it means the Na is not actually holding hands with Cl. In the final container, the Na, which used to be fine dissolved with carbonate, we check, is Na good dissolving with Cl? Well, yes, table salt is very fully dissolved. In this case here, we'll just be plain old Na and plain old Cl minus, just swimming around solution. So where I actually put two NaCl aqueous, it actually didn't form a new bond. It's actually not a new attachment. It actually didn't change at all. So in fact, what we can do here is we can say from the complete and ionic and total ionic equation, we can write what's called a net ionic equation. Net means overall, and net basically involves let's cancel any spectator ions. Let's cancel any ones like spectators at a game. Uh, they just watch the game. They don't participate in it. Um, they just, they're the same on both sides. So for example, I used to have any swimming around my original bottle. I still have any swimming around the end. That's a spectator. Cancels out. The other spectator here you should be able to see is two chlorides are swimming around before, two chlorides swimming around afterwards. Those also get canceled out. Those ones are spectators. Once you've canceled it out, we've actually dig deep through this um, equation and we actually see well, really, what's happening? The Na and the Cl actually themselves don't change. They're still around. They're just spectators. They're just swimming around the, the beaker. Really, what's ending up happening was calcium from your first calcium chloride solution has found carbonate from your second. Uh, this is the sodium carbonate solution. And these ones here have reacted in one-to-one -one ratio, forming a solid precipitate. This really has made a new bond underneath the double replacement. This is actually the overall equation. So that re is referred to as the net ion equation. We only need to do this uh, for a double placement reaction. 
Lastly for today here is we're going to switch over a very special case of a double replacement reaction. This is going to be reaction type number 6 and that type here is going to be called a neutralization. So neutralization, we're going to use N for it. Uh, neutralization here, we're going to look uh, back at our, when we had done naming, we started with naming of acids. Neutralization involves taking an acid, reacting it with a base, an acid somehow does the opposite of what a base does, they neutralize each other and if you remember from your junior science classes you can imagine this guy ends up forming a salt and it ends up forming water. Let's predict why we always form water. Well to be an acid by definition it's supposed to be to release an H which means I probably should have an H something. So again I'm just going to say HA that's the compound HCl, HBr, HGS4 what have you. For a base in a similar way it's supposed to re release a hydroxide it's supposed to release an OH in solution. So when you release hydroxide, there's an OH. We're going to need to modify this later on in our acid-base chapter. Not all bases actually have an OH, but they somehow are able to release this OH. For the time being, let's just say it does. So it's BOH, NaOH, LiOH, what have you. You'll notice this is basically a double replacement. We have a compound and a compound. It's just that the one compound is called an acid, has an H. The other compound is a base. It doesn't have, uh, it has the hydroxide. So what's going to happen is we're going to swap places. I don't need to check activity series. The metal swaps places with the metal. Make sure you have a metal and non-metal on both sides. So in this case, uh, let me actually do it this way first. I know it's going to be the metal fighting against the metal. So this B here is going to fight A, uh, fight H, and it's going to be bonded with A. This is going to end up forming BA. That's going to be the leftover ionic compound with which specific acid and which specific base I was looking at. The word salt here doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be table salt. Salt just means some general ionic compound. Something with a metal, no metal, what's left over from the acid and base. But what's curious here is when the H actually swaps places with B and actually bonds with OH, we end up forming HO. And then what's HO here? Well, HO is actually just two H's and an O, so we're going to write H2O that way. So the reason why neutralization is called neutralization, it is a special case of double replacement. The reason why it always forms water is because it takes the H from the acid. In fact, this would be the net ion equation. The H plus from the acid reacts the OH minus from the base and it ends up reacting in a one-to-one -one ratio to form HOH. Sometimes that actually is easier to balance using HOH, so you can leave it written like that, but very commonly they swap it over to write H2O, where two H's and O is basically just water. We can actually use that as a hint, and we'll end off with this one here. Let's say I have phosphoric acid. Make sure you practice all your naming of acids here. Let's react it with, let's say, strontium hydroxide. Again, the tricky thing is they're only going to give you the left-hand side. Same three keywords here. They're going to ask you predict, balance, classify. Or we're going to make a guess here. We're going to make a prediction. Because I recognize this one here is an acid, this one here is a base. We need both of them to neutralize. It's possible an acid can react with some compound that's neither acid or base. That's not neutralization. An acid and a base, it's going to produce a salt. That salt here is going to be left over. Well, it's going to be a metal, non-metal. In this case, here is going to be strontium with phosphate, SR with PO4, and then we're going to get our HOH. I'm just going to leave it written as HOH for now. That's our water. Do yourself a favor and double check you've written the compound correctly. Strontium is an alkaline earth, so plus two. Phosphate is a polyatomic that has negative three. When I work out those ratios, I actually need three strontiums and two phosphates. Whenever you have more than one of a polyatomic, you have to put brackets around it. And then now, once you've written the formulas correctly, we can then do the balancing. What we can actually look at is we can say, well, the acid's job is actually to give out H pluses. Currently, there's three H pluses. The base's job is to give hydroxide. Currently, there are two. Well, those two need to match up because our net equation says for every H+, plus, it reacts in a one-to-one -one ratio with hydroxide and ends up forming one water. So what did 2 and 3 both go into? Well, if I doubled this and made it a 6, and I tripled this and made it a 6, at least 6 H+, pluses, so I times 2 for that compound, I times 3 for this compound, 6 OH minuses, I know right away this should end up forming 6 waters. And at that point, there it should be fully balanced. Let's just double check for ourselves here. 2 times 3 makes 6 H's, 6 H's. 3 times 2 make um, 6 OH's, so 6 times OH. 3 strontiums, 3 SR's, 2 phosphates, 2 of the grouping phosphate, and there we go, it's fully balanced. 
Um, the reason why it's easier to balance with HOH is you can see this is the acidic proton and this is the basic hydroxide. Sometimes when you actually condense as H2O, I don't know whether to count. You could actually say something like six waters like this. Oh, six times two means I have 12 just H's. Well, I have two times three, six there. Three times two there, there's six there. You could actually add it up sort of element by element. It's just a little bit harder because it doesn't separate acid from the, um, uh, the base. So uh, keep practicing your way through the worksheet here. Some of the worksheet reactions are really, really strange, but for the majority of them, you should be able to do. Sometimes they actually do reacting conditions. So uh, sometimes on your worksheet, you might see a triangle symbol. That triangle just actually means a heat treatment. I probably don't need it for this reaction, but uh, in case there's any special pressures or any catalysts that are involved, I would put those above or below the arrow just to indicate to you what the reaction is going to be. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, guys.